there's always going to be a, a type of person that's more interested to take risks or to play with new initiatives than than others, right? Um, and those will probably be again at the forefront of of this um, this type of change. Hello, everyone. I'm Ken Coles, General Manager of Farming Smarter, and today my guest is Dr. Willemine Apples. She works at the Lethbridge College and has been here now for how many years? Three years, I hear? Three years, yes. I can't believe it. It, f- it feels like just yesterday I saw you at the Agronomy Update with your first presentation before I think you were even officially uh, allowed to work here. Is that, that yeah, what happened? Yeah, you had that's a little correct. bit of hiccup before you ever started. I needed a, a work permit to start, and I didn't even have that yet in January 2016. But that came through quickly and then started here March 1st. March 1st of 2016. 16. Time flies when you're having fun. So how's it been? Uh, what's what's your general impression of Southern Alberta and, and, and the Lethbridge College since you've finally made it here and, and established your roots here? Um, well, it took a while to get settled in. Um, Lethbridge is, is a community where people know each other really well and then to move in as an outsider takes some time to get to know everyone and get up to speed with what's going on here. Uh, but the college... Um, provided a really nice sort of, well, here you go, uh, build a research program atmosphere straight from the beginning. So um, that was a great place to start. And um, it was easy enough to pick up partners um, pretty quickly and, and get rolling on some field work and, uh, and dive into irrigation, basically directly in the summer of 2016. Perfect. And this was sort of a new initiative, and it, it was based on, a, I think, a grant that started things or a donation. Can you maybe explain a little bit about uh, what the Mueller Research Chair is, is all about? So the Mueller family uh, left an endowment, um, Dorothy and Lloyd Mueller, when they passed away, they left an endowment to the college that had to be spent on applied research that was relevant to the region. And they weren't farmers themselves, but they, they did have an, um, an interest in agriculture. And uh, the college then decided that that a large part of that endowment would be spent on applied research and irrigation. Um, So they then matched up the endowment with uh, a donation of them of their own. Um, And that money is uh, in the in the interest that's coming off of the investment that's fueling the research group. So then what does it mean to be uh, an irrigation research chair here at the Lethbridge College? Um, It means that I don't have to teach classes unless I really want to. (laughs) Um, so I do teach the uh, advanced irrigation course, or at least half of it, and really focused on running, creating projects and, and running them uh, with students from college, with students from elsewhere, um, and working with industry partners, focusing on any uh, type of technology or management strategy that could be of interest for the future and, and I guess also the uh, today's status of irrigated agriculture in the region. I think that makes sense. I think Southern Alberta is a pretty special place with the irrigation that we have. And I, I know that it's added tremendous impact and, and economic impact to, to our region with, uh, what are we, over 1.7 million or even a little bit more than that now, acres of, of irrigation? Uh, I'm not very good on my acres. Sure. Uh, well, it's, it's, metric, I know it's a, it's a big number. It's a big and number. It's 600,000 hectares, I think, uh, okay. and over. And um, it's a good percentage of, of all of Canada's irrigated acres in Southern Alberta. Here, yeah, right? yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's um, and it's definitely the the region where we have the biggest field cropping under irrigation. Mm-hmm. Um, so it makes sense to have this position for for you to focus in on on that very special part of agriculture here in southern Alberta. I think absolutely. Yeah. yeah. So maybe tell me a little bit about your background and what it was that attracted you to to this job and and what you hope sort of to achieve with the program. So I did all my training, um, bachelor, master's, and PhD in Wageningen University in the Netherlands. Um, then uh, I f- after I finished my PhD, I moved to Canada, started off in Saskatoon. Um, and there I worked on projects in reclamation projects in the oil sands region, as well as some prairie hydrology, um, dry land, obviously, but looking at how snow melt uh, affects runoff generation in, in uh, lower leaf areas and in areas with you know, small ponds. And um, um, when I saw this position, at first I thought, well, I'm not really good at adding water to land. I'm really good at getting rid of it, but not so much in sort of providing it to a crop. Mm -hmm. Um, But then looking into it, I realized that it's mostly 
um, it's all based on on how do you use the um, uh, the spatial patterns that you can find in the landscape. How can you interpret those and use them to um, to make an optimal water balance throughout your entire field? Um, and that's a, a topic that I've studied in in various settings now, and I really like the idea of of doing that for an agricultural setting again. So some of that that interest in in hydrology this sort of makes me think think about the transition that we've had here in southern alberta this is the the palliser triangle it was once once thought that farming could never happen here and now it's interesting that we're one of the hotbeds as far as uh economic development is concerned in in farming and and with this use of of irrigation so so integrating how do we use the water within sort of the natural dynamics of the landscape is, is it probably a pretty relevant thing now too. So yeah, and especially because the, the amount of water you have is, is finite, right? Yeah. We're not pumping out of an aquifer that's deep down and where we can sort of say, well, if we can't get enough water anymore this year, then we'll just uh, pump a little bit deeper mm-hmm. and we'll get some more. It's, there's water from a snowpack that's ending up in a river and we can store it temporarily in a reservoir, yep. uh, but when the reservoir is empty, we have no more water. So you have a clear, a very direct feedback between this is what there is, this is what we can do with it, how can we make the most of, of that amount of water. But at the same time, we're somewhat spoiled with our water availability. I think when you compare our availability to, say, areas in the southern U.S. where they are pumping out of aquifers and such, and, and that constraint tends to push us towards efficiency. So I imagine this, this efficiency piece is, is relevant to your program and important to your program. But I honestly, I feel like, like we're pretty spoiled with, uh, with the amount of water that we have. We're, we're in a good spot where we do tend to have good snowpacks and large amounts of waters. And it's, it's you know, honestly, I, as a farmer too, not too often that we actually have restrictions put on us no, exactly. as far as how much water to yeah. use. And I think that what I've seen is the efficiencies have been more driven by economics than by water scarcity. Do you, may, maybe that's going to change. That might change. Um, I think it's also because it's so obvious. Um, you've never fallen into the trap of, oh, we will be able to pump forever um, because you always see how big your snowpack is and, and you know that there's a limit to it. So mm-hmm. when the water licenses were um, were closed, that was just based on observations. It makes you aware of um, of what you have available at the beginning, mm-hmm. um, and the system has been designed and, and organized such that everyone can have enough within that finite volume. Right. Um, if we were to expand just blindly uh, with a new potato processor coming to town, and all of a sudden uh, we'd allow everyone who wants to, to start farming potato acres uh, and give them irrigation access to it, we'd probably be looking at a much, um, a much larger depletion real quick. Yeah. There's a, it's, a, it's a nice region in the sense that you, you know how much water you're sort of going to get. Yeah. Um, and there's a system in place that really makes sure that everyone who is irrigating gets what they need to grow a good crop. So then water can become quite political, I imagine. Um, how do you separate out those types of pressures versus I'm going to focus on the science part of, of efficiencies? Um, sort of taking the, the political and the policy situation as a given um, and as an, an, uh, sort of a, an upper limit of Somewhat what's... controlled variable? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. yeah, basically it's, it's, not, it's not one that fluctuates on the time scale of, say, the weather yeah. or... Um, or the growth cycle of, of any crop, hmm. right? It's, it's, it's going to be there for a longer t- period of time. So that's happening. Then what do you see as the next opportunities or problems that you're going to need to deal with within your program? Um, well, if you think of, of tailoring water applications uh, more closely to what a, or more precisely to what your crop needs, um, even variable in a field, uh, or more variable in time as you see the increase of, of monitoring techniques to um, uh, to figure out what the, the actual crop water demand is or what the actual soil water depletion is. Um, we'll be looking at, at a situation in which uh, producers will probably demand that or, or have a much more sudden demand for 
uh, irrigation water. So for the districts to be able to to deliver that water in a timely fashion means that there has to be some kind of feedback between the field um, mm-hmm. and the district. Now that is more, it's going to be more important and more time sensitive, I think, um, than it has been up till now. So you're thinking about ways of incorporating more data that would provide a feedback loop for those types of decisions is that what probably you mean? Yeah. yeah i mean at the moment we're working at the at the field scale still to incorporate data and observations into decision making mm-hmm. for a farm or for a field um, but the next step would then be to then um, level that information to the scale of the district to make sure that everyone um, can uh, can respond to the water needs of their crops um, while not clogging up the system or, or all of a sudden pulling it completely empty. So there, there's a part in, in how, how do we deliver water and the timeliness of it versus matching that with crop requirements, basically. Yeah, yeah, cool. I think so. So to date then, and, and what you've learned so far about our irrigation system in the past, where do you think the, the biggest gains and efficiencies have come from? And how does that impact where you'd like to move it forward? Um, well, definitely the conversion from canals to pipelines mm-hmm. um, and um, high pressure to low pressure pivots. Those are the, the two main main efficiency. Say, um, the largest figures. impacts yeah. to the industry. Yeah. yeah. And um, I think, um, like, of course, I'd like to focus on water use efficiency for a farmer. It probably means that there, there has to be a focus on some kind of yield increase or, or at least growing benefit mm-hmm. as well. Um, or cost savings on energy. Cost, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. So, um, so that's where the um, uh, the uh, incorporation of, of precision irrigation or, or variable rate irrigation will have to um, will have to show some some true benefits. Um, and I think that it's going to be a sort of a future where you don't have one um, one size fits all solution. Right. Uh, but again, looking at the landscape, um, for some producers, uh, solution A might be uh, the most economical as well as the uh, the most water uh, efficient mm-hmm. um, on a different field, different setting of topography, um, soil types, um, soil depth, some groundwater influence. You may look at a, at a fully different uh, system and a different level of technology that you need in order to manage that most optimal. System. I, I think what you've keyed into is, is, is quite interesting. It's a very complex, dynamic world of managing water. But when you focus in at the producer level, then they're, they're not, what you're saying then, is that right? That there isn't necessarily a cookie cutter approach that's going to work for, for each producer that you really need to zero in on, first of all, what his cropping system is or her cropping system, as well as their comfort level and technology and, and what information they need yeah. to be able to specifically manage what happens on their farm. Is that yeah, kind of yeah, what you're Yeah, exactly. Going for? I think the, the cookie cutter was the low, uh, low pressure center pivot, for instance, right. and yeah. pipeline versus a small canal. Um, but now we're at such a level where you're starting to tailor to a specific field or a specific farmer's needs. Yeah. I love that. I think that that is exactly what we like to do within Farming Smarter as an organization is that I think we have done a great job in agriculture of capturing the low-hanging fruit when it comes to many different aspects of agriculture, including agronomy and and crops. But to now specifically zero in on what's going to happen or what's going to work better at a regional level and even at a farm level uh, is really the next phase that we need to go through as far as adapting and developing our techniques to do a better better job at farming smarter. So the challenge with that though is that in the past folks were able to say fund great initiatives that would have these broad um, impacts across an industry but now we're talking about making an even bigger investment to make smaller changes at the farm level. So one of my concerns is is how do you garner support for that and who supports it and and how do you sort of sell the successes of that which is kind of an important job for a researcher too right and that um, was a very loaded question so sorry about that <laughs> so kind of trying to fly under the radar while answering that yeah <laughs> no i think i think you're right and 
it may not be for everyone. Um, but I think there are there are simple gains. Um, there's always going to be a, a type of person that's more interested to take risks or to play with new initiatives than than others, right? Um, and those will probably be again at the forefront of of this um, this type of change, as they may have been with the fully automated tractors or the ab- adoption of, of variable rate. Uh, fertilizer applications. That doesn't mean that there's nothing in there for everyone. And I think that part of the research that we're doing is also, is, is it's not just being on one farm and measuring the hell out of a field and pivot and everything. Uh, but it's also then to take that information, um, model it for the region and say, okay, well, if we know that there's that 50% of all of our fields um, only have two meter elevation difference, and it's one nice horizontal sloping um, angle mm-hmm. in versus uh, 10% where you have 10 little hills in one field in, in one quarter section. Um, what difference would adopting that, say, a variable rate irrigation pivot um, in the one field mean versus the other field? What what are your power savings? What are your water use savings? Are there any? What are your gains in terms of optimizing yield based off of your water conditions uh, in those two fields? Mm-hmm. Um, and then sort of showing that the variety of, of where you could have uh, more success with certain technology and where you should just focus on, on delivering water very timely. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think that that showing how that works is a responsibility of researchers, especially if you're doing or running an applied research program. Um, but it may also, there, there may be a couple of what if scenarios that you don't necessarily answer with data from a field, uh, but that are, that you, you're running with a model or um, um, a simulation tool based on observations that you've done in a, in a field. Wow, Willamine, I gave you a loaded question and you gave me a loaded answer. Um, so many things that you said, I, I think, struck home with me. Um, part, part of the, first of all, you talked about applied research and what, what does that actually mean to you? Um, I, one of the things that I've noticed is that there's a lot of ambiguity into what it is that we do at sort of the farm level and, and how that compares to what other scientists do and that you know you made a comment too about you don't necessarily always have to answer everything with data and that sometimes logistics will will trump what the information is showing us so i guess to be clear then for for you my first question is 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 how important is that practical side of it and 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 is that really what applied research is is i think that we have to be able to provide something that farmers can readily use maybe not understand, but we we need to demonstrate it to them. But, you know, you know what I'm getting at here? It's not very clear. But. Yeah. Well, and that's part of the outreach, I would say, after applied research. Okay. So, may I, and I would tend to agree that outreach is a larger part of any applied research project than it would be of a, of a basic mm-hmm. research project. Um because and outreach, that's, that's, uh, that's your new word for what we used to call extension that nobody uses anymore? Oh, right, yes. Is that right? I think so, Just yes. to be clear. Yeah. <laughs> so so, <laughs> so getting it's, that it's information getting, out and getting it used. Yeah, getting your findings out and getting them used. Yeah. What I think for me applied means is that it's um, that you are focusing, okay, on, on what is the situation in my region yeah. um, and how can uh, findings... Or, or facts about the world that we've learned from basic science, mm-hmm. how can they be used to optimize the situation in irrigated agriculture in this case? So it's somewhat so, adaptive in nature. I've been, it, I've been grabbing onto that word a lot lately. Yeah, it's, uh, I guess it's adaptive, it's uh, fairly practical, and it's not so much based on uh, my personal curiosity as to how the world works, as it is on the curiosity of a group of people right. that want to know uh, a certain thing about how they, uh, about their You have to have practice. an audience that cares about what you're working on, basically. Yeah, yeah. yeah. <laughs> and the question... Or a vested interest. Right. Uh, yeah. That and, and the research question does not necessarily have to be the most innovative ever. 
Mm-hmm. Like, I don't have to uh, prove that there's a, a new type of gravity, let's say. Yeah. Um, but um, we want to know how, um, how that new type of gravity uh, works for our situation or for our region or for our sector of business. Mm-hmm. Um, so hydrology, in which I was trained, there's, is a very applied science by and of itself. Yeah. It's, a, it's very much a science of place. Um, we know how water flows through a porous medium. Sure, there are some details that, that we're not really quite sure of. And there are, but most of the time, hydrologists are fighting over um, how to represent the processes that we know occur, how to represent them well on different scales of a landscape or, or a, a watershed. And so in that sense, that's precisely what we're doing here in the Applied Research Program. It's, okay, we know that you know, gravity pulls water down, that horizontal water flow may occur in, in groundwater situations, saturated situations, or overland flow. Now, how do those processes at a field scale uh, conspire to generate a, a spatially variable uh, field of soil moisture? And what does that matter for the crop? Does it matter? Mm-hmm. Or is it after a month, is it all empty and we should be watering uniformly anyway? Right. Uh, you touch on a really, really good point there. I, I've been involved in a lot of variable rate type research too and a a lot of the findings that we see is that there is so much variability out there that can we actually manage it and you made some comments about not necessarily dealing with things at an individual field level but rather more general terms within a region. I think that's actually a a pretty good insight and, and also an important way to sort of frame your thoughts is because if it's that complicated that we have to study the heck out of one field versus coming up with some general concepts that will work for many types of fields, um, I find that our industry tends to get lost in that. And that um, rather than sort through all the noise, like how do you get, in, in all honesty, how do you sort through the noise and the fact that you can't necessarily prove that one method works in all situations um, and that's the challenge, I think, of really trying to adapt to, to regional type processes. But there, there's some sort of a balance there between being able to prove that it works on a, on a grander scale than an individual field. So you've got, say, for example, an individual precision ag company that says their methodology works 100% of the time. And, and then we come in as scientists and say, well, that's not what I'm finding and that that it, you know, generally that there's just so much variability that we can't necessarily manage it appropriately. And then there's that fight between whether I'm selling a product or I'm just trying to discover what works best for most. Right. Yeah. Yeah. yeah and it's, there's, it's sort of an error margin and an uncertainty band around what you find in a field or, or mm-hmm. how you manage um, uh, an application of, of whatever input you're considering. And the question is always, is, is the change that you make um, to, to your prescription or to your application, is that, um, of, it's, is that so different that you're actually outside of your, your uncertainty levels? Yeah. Or is it just really, yeah, And then that, that is something that you can apply to your projects, is, is that sort of statistical analysis of, of what's happening. And, and how do we, like, we're, we're used to that traditional approach of, of certainty levels, but when we're, te- we're dealing with spatial and temporal variability, I think it's a lot more innocuous and in that a lot of people, including myself, don't totally have our heads wrapped around what it actually means. And then it turns into more of a belief system rather than a proof system. Yeah, yeah. And it also, it becomes then really easy to say, uh, and that's maybe the other side of the medal. It's easy to say, well, we'd better not do anything because really, what do we know? Yeah. Um, so it's trying to find the balance between, okay, we should be really, really precise about every square meter that we have in this field versus, well, if we just apply three quarters of an inch every week, then we're good. Yeah. Um, so it's finding the balance and, and moving forward between those two extremes. So we don't want to stop studying, basically, is what you're saying. And and I, I like the old saying that anything that can be asserted without evidence can be dismissed without evidence. So yeah. our goal then is to provide some evidence that there are things that we can be doing better. Right. Right. Exactly. Yeah. 
So then why don't you tell me a little bit about, we'll shift gears a little bit here, about some of the technologies that you're interested in studying, um, specifically like soil moisture sensors and, and what other fancy technology that you're trying to incorporate into your projects? Um, yeah, so we have a, it basically every project that we run will involve a, a whole bunch of soil moisture sensors. Mm -hmm. um, most of them work good <coughs> enough as long as you calibrate them f before you install them and just make sure that you install them correctly. Um, so we're not so much focusing on, on saying, okay, which one is the best? We're really working with the information that we get out of, out of them. Um, and then we're trying to incorporate uh, drone and satellite imagery into our sort of our understanding of the field and ideally also in, in moving forward with um, prescribing how much irrigation the field needs. Um, that's still fairly tricky. Mm -hmm. um, yes, you can use it to analyze what's been happening, um, but um, figuring out how to decide what to do next, um, that's for us, it's still a, cha a challenge. And, and I presume that's uh, the same for most irrigated producers. I do a fair bit of modeling, uh, like physical modeling. So um, simulating the different processes in the landscape and, and seeing how they behave over space and time um, to see if, they m if those observations that we make can be explained from certain hydrological theories and come up with a sort of an, an indicator of how variable is a field. Can we make an index that says, okay, if you give me an, an elevation map and a, a soil type map of your field, uh, we can run some, some clustering tests and some statistical techniques and spatial sorting uh, algorithms to say how variable uh, your field is and, mm -hmm. and what that might imply for irrigation management. So it's not the most popular form of modeling. This type of modeling is almost, in some sense, a bit of a swear word. Like, you throw out the, the model world and, and most people just sort of shut down. It's like, yeah, you can model all you want. Is it, is it real and, and does it matter and, and, and is it going to take us anywhere? Um, yeah, I, I, I know that. <laughs> <laughs> um, it's a, it can be a really good tool to ask what if questions. Yeah. And it can help you generate hypotheses about where to measure, how long to measure, and what to look for. That's, it's also coming from you know, a, lo a lot of people that, that work mostly with, uh, with experiments. Um, they don't trust models. They think, well, um, y you, it, it's, it's simulated, it's not real. Yeah, it's a complex environment. Yeah, they, uh, if you only trust data, then you've got to be really sure that that one data point that you measured at that one location at that one moment moment in time mm -hmm. is representative for your entire field. Wasn't that the problem with soil moisture probes in general? It's the problem with soil moisture in general okay. because it's so it's quite variable. Yeah. That doesn't mean that if you put out uh, 20 probes in different locations in a field, you won't be able to discern patterns. Okay. We had a really nice field last year with a, a lot of elevation difference and some uh, drainage and, and groundwater issues as well, where you could see groupings of, of soil moisture levels. Mm -hmm. You wouldn't be able to detect those from just one survey or from one sensor, right. but by probing around at different locations in the field for a sustained period of time, you do see that. Now that's something that you can model with a reasonable certainty. That sounds exciting to me, except that for some reason right now, everything is so bloody expensive. You know, to get a probe, even one single probe, and then they want you to pay for a subscription fee to have a modem on it so you can get the data out. And, you know, it's sometimes $1,700 or more in a year for one probe, one point in time. Right. It seems really cost prohibitive to me. And then we also have this internet issue too. So unless I physically want to go download these these probes, then it seems like there's this really big economic barrier and there's also this data transfer barrier that's, I think, getting in the way of moving this forward. So um, do you think that we're going to be able to overcome these? I know that sometimes I think the businesses that are promoting these are obviously they're in it to make a buck and I don't blame them for that. But to be able to get the information that we really need at the mm -hmm. farm level, it's it's incredibly cost prohibitive. And yeah. So, so how do you address that? I think the the one um, light on the horizon there is the, um, uh, the the sort of the hub setup, where you have multiple probes or, or multiple sensors communicating to one central hub mm -hmm. through a short uh, radio signal, and then you download your data from the one hub. Yeah. And 
I haven't seen those yet from the sensors that I like best. Okay. But I know they're working on it, so that's kind of like, well... Yeah, I priced one out similar to that for my own farm, and, and what I wanted was going to cost me about $8,000 for one field. Right. And, yeah. and then it's like, well, um, like to me, I, I'm one of these guys, if I'm not going to get what I need right off the bat, then I'm not going to do it at all. Yeah. So I hope that you can still come out and put probes on my farm and give me some free information this year. <laughs> yeah. See what we can do. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, no, and that's that's true. It's It's a bit of a waiting game, and I'd like to, I would like to work on that, I don't have that expertise. Yeah. Um, so hopefully, you know, we'll be able to come up with, with some uh, collaborations there to, to work on the communication issues. Mm -hmm. um, because I think once you have that sorted, uh, or if you just have someone who, who hacks the system for you, <laughs> then basically the, the parts are there. Yeah. It's just bringing them all together. So then your job will be, what can I do with the data, which is just as important as being able to get the data, right? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Yeah, and so part of what we're doing in the coming years for a CAP program is also figuring out, well, you know, in our research setting, we can uh, we can put in five points with five different depths in five different farms. Mm -hmm. Okay, how much of that information do we actually need to come up with a good description, a prescription of irrigation? Kind of like what's the marginal cost of marginal returns of soil sensor? Right, things? yeah, okay. and can we, can we, um, find the points that have that will have the most uh, information um, right off the bat from um, from looking at maps and, and combining them into uh, clusters or, or zones mm -hmm. based on some statistical techniques. And that would be based on your hydrology type background information or the elevation and all that? Um, it could either be hydrology, but maybe some static mapping, so the topography and soil yeah, maps, etc. Tell et me, what does that mean, static uh, mapping? everything that doesn't change. So a soil okay. moisture map would change over time. Yeah. A topography map doesn't really change over the, the course of the season. Sounds good. So, uh, so yeah, I'm hoping to get a, a, a master's student working on that soon, next year, maybe. Mm -hmm. um, because, yeah, what, how much information do you need to make a, a good decision um, and how much will it cost to get that information? Yeah. That's that's sort of those the are all big barriers. So it's obviously that you've got lots of work to do ahead of you, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so you you've also been involved in other types of, of research, like the the subsurface drip irrigation. Are there there other pieces to this puzzle that you think might be influential in the future here? I'm pretty excited about um, combining satellite data and and from different sources mm -hmm. because the problem that we always hear uh, when when people say, well you know, I want to use an, an irrigation app that's based on satellite imagery. It's that the satellite takes eight days to, to return. Um, or, well, the individual satellite will take 16 days to return, but if you have two, then it's only eight. That, okay. That's a, a spatial or a temporal resolution that's not useful to any farmer. And that's obviously completely true. Yeah. But there are so many satellites out there these days that with a little bit of puzzling, you can get a daily map of your field. Um, and it's going to be somewhat accurate in telling you how much moisture is in the, in the field? Or? Um, it can be either moisture in the field or uh, your crop coefficient. So if you have a, a forecast of what your evapotranspiration will be in the coming days, so a little bit more than just the temperature, uh, air temperature in the, in the coming week uh, and how uh, fast the wind will blow, mm -hmm. um, it could give you uh, an estimate of how much your crop will need at various areas of your fields. Or various or areas how much of it your would respond operation. To, essentially. Yeah, yeah. Um, there's been a really nice app developed in Australia, Irisat, uh, that does that. Um, I've had a student, a uh, graduate from our CIT program, sort of make a Canadian version of that. Mm -hmm. He's still working on it. Um, it requires some bringing together some pieces. Again, um, if you don't have a forecast of ET, if you don't have that crucial bit of information then then your app becomes well southern alberta less. you can pretty much say that it's always high probably yeah <laughs> that and in and in combination with with what the stage of your crop is right, right? so um so very much focused on developing that information that will give the farmers the ability to decide when and how much water to apply yeah yeah okay. um and i also last year i worked with afc based out of saskatoon um, who partnered with a company that makes uh, microwave uh, radiometers that you put on a pivot. Mm -hmm. So you sense ahead 
of, of irrigating, you sense how much moisture is present in the top 60 centimeters of the soil. Okay. Now at the moment, that technology is not connected to a decision-making system. So, so it's not like the pivot could literally change how much it's putting down based on that. Right, not that yet. Quickly. But, but that's the hope. That's the hope. And realistically, if so, so the the guy that developed that uh, that radiometer, he worked a lot on the communication side of things, mm -hmm. so he can get the data real quick, and then adding a prescription decision to that based on on what you know of your field, mm -hmm. that doesn't have to take so much time. So that is actually quite close, I think, if you if you have the right combination of people who know about the processes that determine. Uh, how much water you'll need somewhere versus someone who knows how to get the information from one sensor and then feed it back into uh, to the sprinkler system. And are the are the pivots physically able to do that or do you have to have each nozzle now on a solenoid type thing? You might have to uh, do each nozzle or you could probably control it per bank or, or, or even if a basic version would just be to, to slow down and speed up the pivot as you right. go along, right? So the retrofitting of the pivot would have to depend on, on the level of accuracy that you want to achieve, or the, not accuracy maybe, but the, the level of variation that you want to be able to control. Mm -hmm. So in a system like that, how do you, how do you as, a, as a researcher, how, how do you think you can actually prove that it's worth it? So the farmer has a big investment. Usually when you're an early adopter, it tends to be quite a bit more of an investment. Um, given that level of variability, like to play the skeptic role is, you know, how do you prove that that's actually different when you're actually modifying the environment that you're studying? It's kind of like that whole Schrodinger's cat type principle. <laughs> yeah, well, and, and this is where you need to have access to fields where you can also, uh, where you can modify conditions, right? Because we work mostly with producers with an active operation. Mm -hmm. So we can't say, well, what happens if you don't water this piece of land? for a while, yeah. nobody would allow us to do that. But on a, a dedicated piece of land, a demo farm or whatever, you can do that. Okay. So that's where you'd have to test this technology and say, okay, what happens if um, we've identified different landscape types, we have a, a, a hill, a depression, a, a slope area. Um, what if we, uh, we water these three areas depending on what a soil moisture sensor says or what mm. this uh, microwave radiometer tells us to compared to uh, our general uh, recommendation from an agronomist in the three zones. What do we see are differences in terms of, of water use conditions? Uh, what would that mean in terms of uh, power use? It's of course a little different if you have it under one pivot in different sort of patches. Um, and did it have a, a, a difference in, in yield uh, quantity and quality? If so. As long as you can control those variables, right? Uh, and I think that's one of the challenges yeah. within this whole field is that you're, you're dealt with so much variability that can we realistically control it enough to understand what's happening? I mean, we can have a variable rate rainfall. You can have half an inch of rain on one side of the field and a quarter inch on the other. Then that right. sort of throws a wrench in all of our studies and, and everything, right? Yeah, yeah. And that makes it difficult, right? And that's right. why we hope, well, why it sometimes takes so long to say something with... <laughs> <laughs> with any level of confidence. Yeah. yeah, yeah, and it's also how much of your yield is determined by your water availability. Mm -hmm. Is it 30%, 50%, 80%? Yeah. Probably depends per year, right? If you have enough rainfall, then uh, your irrigation scheduling may only determine 30% um, of, of what your yield will be. The right. rest might be how you put on or when you put on your fertilizer. Or, yeah, or uh, something that was you totally had out a, of your control. Either. Right, yeah. if you, you had a, a disease or an infestation of something. Mm -hmm. um, if you have a year that's really dry, then now, of course, your irrigation strategy becomes more important. Then again, maybe if it's really dry, you only have to make sure that you water enough. Yeah. And it doesn't really matter where you put it. Yes, yeah, so I, I it find down. that a lot of times in the seasons that we're having, it's so hot and dry that we're basically limited by the capacity of our irrigation equipment and what they can deliver. Right. So a lot of, and in a lot of fields, that is the case. I would argue that in fields that have more uh, more wetter areas mm -hmm. or lows where snow melt accumulates and, and infiltrates. Uh, so let's not double. make it worse. Yeah. Yeah. So you'd, you'd have sort of, um, that those are the areas where you could actually still increase your yield mm -hmm. if you don't overwater. 
-hmm. because they they are already wet. So with all these limitations and tremendous variability, it doesn't scare you off? You actually want to delve into this world? Mostly, yes. (laughs) Well, and I, I know that's kind of a strange question, but I honestly think that scientists in general avoid this area of study because it is honestly so complicated and so variable. And, and if their main motivation is to try to publish in journals, that, that it becomes quite difficult. Is, is that a, a motivator for you here? Or is it still really more about providing some practical evidence that will, will help farmers in general? Uh, a bit of both. I mean, I do like a complicated puzzle. Mm-hmm. So it is figuring out what you can squeeze out of all these layers of variability that just is a is a topic that I really like in general. Well, I'm glad that you do. <laughs> uh, and having it be of interest to not just myself, but other people as well. Yeah. I, yeah, that's something that it's I It's a really great appreciate. perspective to have, I think. Good yeah. for you. So it sounds to me, and you can correct me if I'm wrong, that, that you're you're interested in, in the hydrology piece and in, in really incorporating sort of the the data, you know, whether you call it big data or not piece and the, the precision agricultural piece. What about a lot of the other approaches that delve in, and maybe it's not your area of expertise, but outside of this magic irrigation zone that we have in southern Alberta, we still have dry land irrigation, and actually a really big proportion of our acres are still dry land. I think we're about 14 million acres versus the 1.7 million that are dry land. And what we've seen over the last 20 years are some major uh, cultural cropping system changes like the zero tillage and trying to ad- address that evapotranspiration piece is number one because in here we're, we know moisture is is the limiting factor. Um, because of the, the luxury of water, we haven't seen that same degree of culture change within the irrigated acres. Do you feel that that is also another piece that we need to be considering? How do we reduce our evapotranspiration in irrigated fields? Um, yeah, I think so. Um, it, it's just a big part of, uh, of being, what do you call it, water smart or something. Yeah. Um, it, getting your yield uh, right is, of course, number one for a, a farmer. But in terms of, of the larger perspective, uh, doing that without adding a drop too much, that'd be great. Mm-hmm. Um, and whether that's, uh, yeah, for, for dryland farmers, that's, of course, way more important directly, but yeah. we should be thinking the same thing uh, in irrigated fields. Also because if you make your field too wet, it will affect your, your vulnerability for disease and, and, uh, and negative conditions in your, your canopy in general. So from a sort of a health perspective, um, as well as a larger environmental perspective, figuring out how to make that evapotranspiration smaller mm-hmm. uh, is a good one. Or look into how you could create a cropping system that um, can deal with um, uh, with drought stress in 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 the root zone better than than others. Just adds it, another layer of complexity, doesn't well, it? Well, <laughs> yeah, and it's um, but it's interesting because it would be taking it from a whole different perspective. So I've talked a bit with uh, an ecologist about could you would polycropping. Uh, have uh, an, an effect on how water is used. Because if you think of it as an ecosystem, mm-hmm. a field as an ecosystem, um, then would it be smart to put in a bunch of straws that all need water at the same time, that all take it up at the same way, yeah. from the same depths, etc. cetera? Um, it'd be really interesting to, to figure that out. Sure. And, and I think and generally there's a big movement towards that that study and, and the um, probably more driven by the impacts on soil health. Mm-hmm. But to think about that in crop water use is also another very interesting perspective, I think. Yeah, yeah. yeah and it, in the end, it's a it's a much larger integrated system of soil, water, and, and uh, living organisms. Mm-hmm. Um, I'm mostly coming in from the water aspect. But if you can build over time um, differences in your, your property, or the, in the properties that control your water availability, uh, by changing soil properties um, or, or by changing how the system needs its water, uh, that would be a really nice new area of study, I think. Cool. So I, I brought up the subsurface drip. Do you think there's potential for that in southern Alberta? I think so. Um, not necessarily to grow um, sections and sections of wheat, mm-hmm. um, but it has a place and um, 
that could be of interest for southern Alberta, especially if you're thinking about um, in intensifying um, production on irrigated acres that are already existing, mm -hmm. um, corners that might not be used at the moment, um, but that could be irrigated with may well mostly less water uh, right. than uh, if you would just to put a corner arm on it. Um, if you have parcels of, of weird shapes, um, this could be a, a way of of increasing your um, your water use efficiency, uh, as well as automating how you put on your water. So how about that whole evapotranspiration piece too? Like uh, they claim that pivots are 90 some percent efficient, but I still wonder about the wind and, and heat that we have, if it's as efficient as it's been calculated or not. Yeah, I mean, I think um, Alberta Ag has some studies out there that show that it is a, a couple of percent points lower in our environmental conditions than, than what most of the the labels on the pivots would say mm -hmm. because of the wind. And, and yeah, if, if you have water stuck in your canopy, it tends to evaporate here more than it will uh, like eventually make its way down to the soil. And that's thanks to the wind, mostly. mostly yeah. yeah, yeah. And um, and you get rid of that component entirely if you have a, a subsurface drip system. You're not necessarily lowering the crop water needs, um, but you're probably lowering the losses from getting the water right out of your system to your crop. So in other areas of the world where water scarcity is is much higher, I understand folks that have the drip irrigation will tend to get priority. So now it, it brings that policy piece back into it. Right. If, yeah. if scarcity is there. I, I mean, I don't think we're anywhere near that. Do you in Southern I Alberta? Don't think so. Not anytime moment. soon anyways, well, but you never know when things change, right? Yeah. And maybe not structurally, but right. that doesn't mean to say that you won't, wouldn't be able to have one freak year where uh, these systems might be uh, the norm. So. Wonderful. So thank you so much for your for your time, Willemine, and, and we look forward to you on uh, putting that puzzle together and, and maybe adding sort of the next phase of, of irrigation efficiencies and wish you the, the best wishes and have a great season. Thanks. You too. Thanks. So if you're interested in more information on Farming Smarter, please check out our website at www.farmingsmarter.com. There's also lots of ways that you can engage in what we're doing. We've got a mailing list for e-newsletters. We'd love for you to subscribe as a, a member to our organization. That's where you can contribute to, to what we do, help direct the organization, and even potentially serve on the board of directors. In addition to that, we have a subscription, an annual subscription for both farmers and agronomists. And within that, you'll have access to uh, added value information that will be really awesome for your farm. So this is, you know, extra videos, access to really cool things like uh, virtual reality 360 degree tours, uh, really up to date uh, information throughout our own research project and connect you with uh, the entire industry of, of agricultural research and extension in southern Alberta and across western Canada. Thanks for joining. Mm -hmm.